Hello, everybody, and welcome to the third discussion circle that I'm having in a series of lectures that I've been giving. Uh, in case somebody just happens to stumble into this video as the latest video that I've put out, you might want to watch the preceding video first. We're going to have a conversation about some topics that came up in that. This whole way of sort of teaching uh, through videos and, and discussion circles is kind of a new experiment that um, life and time have, have thrust upon us. It's kind of exciting for me. A couple of years back uh, when I was a professor at the American University in the Emirates in Dubai, they kind of tried to pressure us to develop these hybrid courses with some online delivery and for college students. And it, it just didn't seem to work very well. I didn't like that. But um, this past year, uh, when we were all sort of under house arrest, we had to develop something. And I developed this way of doing discussion circles for particularly German literature for uh, lifelong adult learners uh, here at Concordia Language Villages in, in Minnesota. And that actually worked very well. And so when I started making videos again, and I thought, how do I answer the questions that people give? I thought, well, let's try this same format. And I kind of feel like this, this um, Zoom discussion circle for adult learners who are just really curious to keep growing their minds has, has great potential for the kind of um, academy of, of learning and discussion that I've always dreamed of. So I'm, I'm pretty excited about this and I'm happy to have the people here joining me today. Uh, my general format is uh, I would give my lectures on Tuesday, wait for questions to come in. They seem to be a, a flood for the first two day, three days. Obviously videos stay up for a long time. People continue to ask questions, but to follow them up a few days later. So um, normally I have these videos on a Friday afternoon, but because uh, I, YouTube analytics tells me that I have about uh, as many viewers in Europe as I have in the United States, obviously for them, it's, it's harder to do that at that time. So um, it is now my Friday morning, but it is my, it is Friday, uh, afternoon or evening for people in Poland and Russia and Greece, which is where um, these people are from today. So let's start by having them all introduce themselves and talk about what brings them here, what makes them interested in, in following these kinds of lectures and what their interest is in, in polyliteracy, polyglottery, all this kind of thing. So um, let's get started. Uh, Katerina, would you like to begin? Mm, yes. Uh, first of all, I'm so happy to be here. It was uh, an honor uh, to be able to um, participate in this discussion. I have been watching your videos and I, for many years, and I really admire you so much. Um, your videos have been very, very helpful for me. Um, I would like to introduce myself. Um, I have a I have studied conservation and restoration of ancient objects and works of art, but I work as an English teacher. I am um, fluent in English. Um, my Japanese is advanced. I have lived in Japan for 10 years, more than 10 years. Um, Chinese used to be advanced, but not anymore. French intermediate. And now I have started uh, to study German and Italian. Uh, I always felt that uh, learning a foreign language is something that uh, excited my mind. I couldn't really understand why uh, it feels like that because most of the people around me would think that it's something really difficult and maybe impossible. I mean, my parents um, did not speak any other language, only Greek. So I was brought up in a monolingual family and all my, my relatives and their friends. Um, so when we started to study English and then when we started studying French at school, Mm. Our parents and relatives thought that, oh, two languages are too many. But uh, later, um, I realized, much older, I realized 
that uh, it's something very natural. And I had the experience in Japan when I was teaching at an international school there to see little kids that uh, were trilingual. Some of them would even speak four languages. And um, I realized that it is uh, natural for people. And I really admire people that uh, are able to study and are consistent because I wasn't so consistent barely yet. And they are able to get to a good point and advance in their language learning. Thank you very much. I'm sorry it was so long. Thank okay, no, that's, that's fine. Thank you, Katarina. And Marcin, you are in Poland? Uh, yes, I'm in Poland and uh, I'm here, I suppose, because I have uh, noticed some uh, uh, poly, poly, polyitis uh, symptoms in me, so uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and uh, I also would like to, to thank you first of all for all the videos which you, which you have made because they really not just influence the, the way I'm learning languages and, and uh, the way I'm, I'm using them, them later, but really uh, th those videos have revolutionized the, the way I'm, I'm learning. Uh, so uh, my um, primary concern was always that uh, to learn a language, it takes uh, a lot of time. It's like uh, years to uh, be in, in if even the basic uh, level of fluency, uh, which uh, apparently if, if uh, one uses methods uh, described in, in your videos, like uh, shadowing and scriptorium, it's not really the case. It's, it's possible to... to uh, progress much much faster uh, and um, also as this, despite my my background which is in uh, electrical engineering and, and informatics uh, I'm uh, really interested in, in uh, literature uh, and uh, yes so so basically when I have when I have started uh, learning languages I wanted uh, to use them to uh, to read uh, some great books in uh, original version uh, also because I, I, I knew always also based on, on my experience with English books that uh, the translation uh, is not always perfect for, for multiple reasons um, also because sometimes translator just, just uh, doesn't have enough time to, to, um, to make an excellent translation so I, I always wanted to uh, to see myself what what an author wanted to to tell. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And uh, Jan, you are in Moscow, correct? Correct. Right. So uh, much like Marcin, I am not a linguist by trade. I'm majoring in chemistry. And in fact, I am a polymath. I'm interested in lots of different stuff and I really want to combine knowledge from all these different fields I'm studying. My interest in languages started in school because I managed to get a breakthrough in my English after watching lots of YouTube videos about video games in English. Um, and that was combined with intensive grammar study with a tutor. Uh, but after English, which got to a really high level, pre like by 14, I managed to pass the C1 Oxford test. Uh, I didn't get a move on with any other language. I tried French, German, Norwegian, Greek, and um, yeah, those didn't go anywhere because I was not systematic. But when I was 16 and I started studying Japanese, I studied much more systematically and actually had a lot of progress with it, made quite a lot of progress with it. And I really enjoyed the process. And um, back in 2018, when I was during my second year at university, I decided to pick up Norwegian again. And I looked up tips on how to learn languages. I came across videos from many, many different polyglots, um, such as Lang Focus, Stephen Kaufman, Moses McCormick, uh, and of course, you, Professor. Uh, your video, you know, the most famous one, the um, Polyglot's daily workout, really left quite an impression on me. And I was like, 
you know, I don't think I will ever be able to do what this guy does, but I really want to get close. I, yeah, that, that one really, really inspired me. And um, yeah, I took the advice to heart. And since then, I've, well, at this point, I've studied about 20 languages, I think, maybe a bit less, but, uh, you know, it's difficult to count. Uh, but on a daily basis, I'm doing like, how many, about uh, four, eight, about 13. I deal with 13 languages outside of English and Russian on a daily basis. So, yeah, I've come here to, well, participate in a discussion with you, which is just, well, this sounds really amazing. I never never thought I'd get the chance. So, yeah. Well, really wonderful. I'm, I'm, I'm glad to have you all here. You talk about having participating in a discussion or conversation, but to me, it, it really starts in the comment section uh, when um, the a video comes out and, you know, the people that have been on the prior discussion circles uh, and you three uh, particularly, you know, just there are a number of people out there that really just get, you know, conversations going and it's very heartening to see that there's a true, you know, people are reading each other's comments and answering them and sharing the benefits of their experience and Jan, I remember you, you know quite a bit about Old Norse and other languages as well. Um, I would like to pick up maybe before we go to some of the comments and questions that people answered, because I think all three of you, but at least uh, Katrina and Jan, you both mentioned being systematic. Uh, and I think that that truly is the key. I mean, so much of the conversations that we have focus on this, that, or the other method, but I think more important than the method is, is the the hard work, the being systematic about it, being regular and systematic is, is how you would get somewhere. And, you know, you're all being modest, but clearly you've studied and, and, and gotten your, um, gotten a good foundation in, in many, many languages already. All of you, Katarina, by going there and living in Japan for so long. Martin, you, Martin, you didn't mention, but I can see that some of the books behind you, you've got all the languages that, that you've uh, yeah, worked so on. I, I haven't, yeah, I haven't mentioned it because, yeah. because usually when I start uh, talking about about which languages I have uh, studied, it takes me an hour. So so I have to cut it down to <laughs> zero. Yeah, but leave yes, it off. <laughs> after, after, after English, I have I have started. Uh, uh, so English, I was learning at school, basically. Later, I, I have done some more practice uh, in order to, to make my English functional, because after, after school, it was not functional at all. Uh, but when I have uh, started watching uh, your videos, I have I have uh, learned uh, German, uh, later Italian, later I was working a little bit on Danish. Danish today I, I don't speak at all, but but I still have some basic understanding. Uh, later it was Latin, uh, Croatian, French, and now I, I have started. Were, ah, uh, Hebrew, of course, uh, and now I have started working also a little bit uh, on Spanish. Mm. Why do you say, of course, Hebrew, of course? What does that mean? Uh, of course, means that, that, that uh, I have forgotten to mention it, and it's the <laughs> the language on which I'm working the, the hardest right now. So, mm. uh, uh, of okay. course, meant that, that I have forgotten the, the, the one which should be obvious at this point okay. for me. <laughs> Yeah, and I love the way that you said you use that term polymath. I mean, we're I talk about polyitis, and you know, we sometimes in 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 the polyglot community, and these sometimes it tends to, I don't know, it, it tends to focus too much on language learning to you know become sort of exclusive. That's why I like to give the twist of poly literacy, adding that literature and culture background. But it's it's really kind of interesting and fascinating to me, refreshing to meet people. What did you say, Katarina, you studied conservation of, of antiquities and Marcin, you're an electrical engineer and Jan, you're a chemistry teacher. I mean, this is wonderful that people who have these other aspects, other, you know, other things to do with their lives also have this, this rich interest in, in languages and, and in getting at literature in the languages. Well, let's, um, let's make sure uh, that uh, as we talk among ourselves that we don't forget to answer um, any of the really pressing comments or questions that some of the people um, posted to uh, my last lecture. 
Um, Marcin, you, you made a, a, a sheet of uh, questions. Do you want to kick us off with one of the first questions that somebody may have posed that if, if it's interesting to you that you could also put your own spin on it and we could address it that way? Yes, sure. So, so one, one of the questions was particularly interesting for me. It was about this essential vocabulary and, and uh, basic sentences. Uh, I think that, that it was posted more than more than once uh, actually in, in the comments. Uh, and uh, uh, my opinion, and I think that also Holt's opinion is is that uh, it makes no really, not really that much sense to uh, to focus on on uh, basic sentences, uh, just because. Uh, we should build up to 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 them with with time. It it really doesn't help a lot uh, if I learn uh, a lot of of uh, basic sentences, uh, a lot of of dialogue which can be used in the restaurant, in the restaurant or in the in the barber shop or wherever. Mm -hmm. uh, because if I don't understand what people are are uh, saying to me, it's it's not that useful and. When I was learning German, I had this idea that, oh, okay, so I'm going now to, to the restaurant, so, so maybe it would be good to, to refresh some, some uh, sentences which are typically, typically used in the restaurant. But then it always turns out that in the restaurant, it's, it's, it's not like that, that people are using all the time the same sentences. Every waiter or waitress will, will use another vocabulary, another grammar structure, we'll, we'll put everything in a bit uh, other way. Uh, so it can be helpful as, as a starter of the, of the conversation to, uh, to say a perfect, perfectly grammatically correct sentence, uh, fine, but, but uh, then, then we, we really just need to systematically build up to, to that level where we uh, can uh, can just uh, follow the, the uh, and follow the whole the whole conversation and and just uh, discuss whatever we want uh, in in the restaurant mm -hmm. or in, in in daily in daily situations. So yeah, I guess uh, it seems to me that kind of unfortunately the 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 view that Hall put out there about the value of basic sentences has pretty much prevailed in most textbooks uh, for learning languages do tend to focus on being almost what I would hate to say, but kind of call it a glorified phrase book. That's the, the idea that the most you start out, you, you want, people want to learn useful things that they can use. But as you just said, you know, it's, if you memorize a dialogue, you're still probably not going to run into this exact dialogue. So um, it sort of reduces the language to that level and then makes you not actually necessarily able to, to use it. And I think it really takes away um, some, some of the interest from it. I mean, it's just not that interesting to, to learn how to, to say that in that level. And that's why I started my uh, sort of preamble in the video. I think that psychologically your system knows, hey, I can already say this perfectly well. And now I'm never going to be able to say this this well, and this is just not that. But if you're thinking it on a totally different level, then you can you know o overcome that. So um, yeah, I, I agree, and that's why I pointed out that I think that if you can you know learn sentences, lear yes, learning holistically and internalizing dialogues is good. But the dialogue should be more interesting, should have more culture, should it go more swiftly to a higher level. Um, I don't know if you all are. I've ever seen some of those linguaphone methods that, that um, I described there. They're not that rare, but you know they all start out by somebody uh, almost doing you know a walkthrough of of a house or of a garden and saying, well, this is over here, and then then they talk about that. And so it, it's it's relevant to what you just saw. And these are things that like you're describing. I would like to know that you know what. This is a picture, and the picture is on the wall, and you learn the vocabulary, the basic vocabulary of of the things that way. So um, yeah, I think that there are better ways of, of getting um, an overall foundation and really into the rich heart of a language than, than basic sentences. Um, uh, Katarina, did you have uh, a question or a comment from somebody else that you could also you know, expand upon and, and give some of your own interpretation to? 
Yes, first of all, I would like to thank Marcin for the photocopies and for the PDF, I made photocopies and it is very helpful. Um, one of the questions here uh, was again by Chris, I think, and it, it says, uh, given the proliferation of fill in the blanks uh, exercises and Facebook like material, has anyone found them to be useful? Um, and also, uh, do you just listen or you just start to really think when one language uh, has a different syntax, for example, subject, object, verb, or subject, verb, object? Um, for me personally, I always found the fill in the blank exercises very useful. Maybe it's a bit boring for some people, but uh, at the beginning for me, until the intermediate level, I think it was very, very useful. And also uh, some drills, I think that the drills also are very important. Even the simple drills um, are very important, especially for some languages like my own language, people that uh, want to learn Greek, for example, that they should do substitution drills and especially correlation drills. And uh, correlation drills were very helpful for me now that I'm studying German uh, for um, when I want to practice the cases, the different tenses, uh, how the pronouns change, which is where uh, have difficult you for me. Where have you found correlation, that kind of drills still for, for German materials? As I mentioned, just sort of searching my memory now, um, I can uh, I find them in older books that are widely available. Yeah, on yeah, the very internet. old books. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. I have no, I don't have them here. I I, uh, I have photocopies. I'm learning German from very old books. One. Uh, uh, so, I, uh, have, let have, me uh, say, uh, uh, excuse me for interrupting. Mm -hmm. yes, ha have please. any of you seen um, these either drills, pattern drills, or correlation drills uh, in any recent modern works in Russia? No, and this is surprising. No, neither have I. Neither yeah. have I. They've been thrown away. It's amazing because, yeah, I just, now, when I'm searching my mind, there is a, a series called Speaking Korean. And that is, uh, was published in Korea for the, and that, that definitely had them. I remember volume two, I couldn't find that to, to confirm that, but yes, I mean, that's, that's more modern, but yeah, for languages that have complex grammatical structures, they're very, very helpful. Um, so it's amazing and, and sad that they've been gotten rid of. Um, did you find the book that you've been using, Katrina? No, sadly, I don't have the photocopies here. I have only the other two books that I'm using uh, currently to learn German. Mm -hmm. But I don't have my my book that is a uh, photocopy. But I also wanted to add that I have many books in my library that have Chinese books that have so so many uh, correlation drills. Uh, they start from subs simple substitution drills. They have correlation drills and the, then progressive drills. This is a pattern that um, the Chinese textbooks use from. Uh, uh, early elementary level uh, until almost uh, the beginning of, of advanced. So many, many volumes of these Chinese textbooks have two or three pages, definitely two or three pages of uh, these correlation. And sadly, I don't have the, mm. the photocopies here. I have them inside. Mm -hmm. in the, in the, but we, 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 all can, we, we all concur and agree then that these are useful. Yes. Yes. It's, a, it's, a, it's a pity that uh, nowadays it's, it's not yeah. possible to, to find it's, them. It is a pity. I think it just goes hand in hand with what you were talking about earlier, Marcin. I mean, just the, the fact that the, the glorified phrase book approach to presenting a language has predominated now in most textbooks. Um, yeah, but, you know, when you come to a group of people like we have here on this screen who are, you know, really more serious about learning languages and you know want to go to a deeper level we would think that hey this is a good kind of exercise please give us this but they out there are thinking well we just want to you know teach people how to you know, say the useful things as, as swiftly as possible that, that was yeah. another thing which really struck me when i uh, watched again uh, your your presentation because at some at some point you have mentioned that 
this this book uh, by by Hall is uh, focused on the classroom, and I mm -hmm. started thinking, oh yes, sure, of course it's focused on classroom, but for a, for a moment I have maybe forgotten about it because uh, it's uh, uh, it, he mentions materials uh, which uh, people uh, who learn multiple languages right now are using. So mm -hmm. uh, texts with translations, which, which mm -hmm. were also uh, removed from, from all the textbooks. Mm -hmm. so, so now uh, a typical classroom looks more or less like this, that uh, we have, uh, let's say, a book for English printed mm -hmm. in England without any translation at all. Uh, if there are transcripts for audio recordings, the transcripts are only in teacher's book. Uh, it's not that easy to, to even buy this teacher teacher's book. If you have texts in, in the in the textbook, uh, usually they don't have any recordings. Uh, so for, even for languages like like English, uh, it's really difficult to imagine how to work with this book. Mm -hmm. In English, it's not that easy to figure out how to pronounce a word if you if you see just uh, just a written text. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so, so today, nowadays, textbooks are uh, for classroom are completely different than uh, what what Hall was was uh, writing in, in his book. Mm -hmm. yeah. Jan, did you have um, any questions that you wanted to pass on from from the others and sort of give your own interpretation and, and addition to them? Right. So uh, there was one question which I. Mm, well, it wasn't really a question, it was more of a, a comment by David1917, who talked about his Israeli friend, who talked about the two different words for play in Hebrew, one of which refers to things like toys, and the other one refers to playing instruments. Uh, and he, uh, his friend said, yeah, he, his friend said that uh, the fact that in English it's the same word is a huge advantage. And well, uh, me personally, I sort of disagree with that. I don't see either option, you know, the the, uh, the presence of a distinction and the lack of a distinction, neither are an inherent advantage. They're just different. They refer to things differently. But then uh, David went on to respond that uh, otherwise you might approach improvisational music in a more rigid way rather than a free boundless form of expression. And, um, yeah, that I still don't quite get it, but I guess what he means, um, what he means to say is that language influences the way we act, the way we you know, sort of go about doing our things. And um, yeah, I guess that's mm -hmm. a thing to discuss. Me personally, I think that's sometimes overstated, but what do you guys think about the influence of language, about the distinctions that a language makes on our perceptions? Like, mm -hmm. so I, I totally agree with you, and I have also added in our notes an, an example, because Hebrew is now uh, in, in uh, yeah. my in interest no, zone, so uh, where first of all, I don't mm -hmm. really agree with this the distinction for uh, between a verb which is which is for playing with toys and and uh, playing music it's not right. exactly true it's it's yeah. it's that there is one verb which is in general for playing not only with toys so you can have a, a sentence like uh, so he's playing football in the first league so it's definitely not for ju just for for fun and and, and uh, uh, not with toys uh, and it's still a, a valid, uh, valid usage of, of this verb. Uh, so there is a distinction be between uh, a general verb for playing and, and uh, verb for, for uh, playing instruments. Uh, there is also, if I'm not wrong, another verb uh, which is specifically for playing a trumpet. It's, it's another, <laughs> another verb. <laughs> uh, but um, I also don't see any... any advantages here and, and I don't think that uh, uh, just because uh, in English speaking countries there is uh, one verb for, for playing that people when, when improvising uh, are less serious about it. It, it depends on, on 
uh, the, the whole the whole group of, of people playing if, if they feel like just having some fun they, they won't yeah. be that serious if, if uh, so, so a simple yeah. verb I don't think that that changes yeah. anything here yeah humans are too complex to be swayed by something as simple as the difference in the use of words Katarina what do you think I think that um... In Greek, also, we use the same verb, which means play, pezo. Uh, I think it shows the attitude uh, towards a certain action. Maybe, maybe subconsciously, it shows that it's something pleasant uh, to do. And maybe it shows how the, the, maybe the, the people feel. I, I think in the language it is hidden. There's something hidden behind the words. There is a certain reason why in every language we use these words. And they, it has to do with the culture, the way that people of this uh, uh, certain country that uses this language um, feel about certain things. I'm not sure if uh, this is true, but I think that it maybe it shows the attitude towards the action. And, in Greek also it's the same so maybe maybe I guess well, what you're talking maybe. about Jan is obviously you probably know it's uh, called the, the basic ideas that the sapir worth hypothesis the idea yeah. that yeah. you're yeah. you're the sapir worth hypothesis basically says that your your language really determines the way you you see the world and you can give some famous examples like well if if my language has no word for private property and to steal, then I can't be a thief because I won't, you know, that, that just the concept doesn't ar arise there. So um, okay. that would be sort of an extreme example. So, I mean, we're all on Zoom right now. We can't put um, our things down, but um, in, in, in those circumstances, we'd imagine we don't have any idea of private property or belong or something. So Marcin would take off his, his, his nice big headset and put it down. And then, um, you know, Katarina could just come and, and pick it up and take it and walk away with it. And, and we wouldn't think, oh, she stole his headset because we wouldn't have any idea for his and, and property or something. So I think that's sort of the, the full illustration of the idea behind it. So I guess what this person is saying, well, the fact that I play like a little boy, let's go, my friends come over and I'm gonna play, let's go play a game and let's play an instrument. So that makes somehow playing an instrument more like playing a game. Um, and I would concur that that's kind of pushing it a bit far, it seems to me. I mean, um, maybe, yeah, I mean, the, there are kinds of music um, where, Jazz, in particular, improvisation is still incredibly important. And so maybe that would be liberating for a jazz musician. But if I'm a trained symphony um, flautist, I'm playing the flute, but I'm not, you know, if I'm up on stage and I'm playing, you know, the, the solo flute piece, you know, I'm, I'm very much in my training systematic mode, even though I'm using the word play. I'm not thinking, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm free and liberated. I'm, I'm remembering everything I was taught in conservatory and trying to give the best performance that I can for the sake of the symphony. So, I don't know, but that's um, an interesting yeah. point. Yeah. Um, any other? So, so an, an, an excellent example. I, I, I have uh, one more I have just recalled. Uh, I had one English teacher in uh, during my studies and uh, he was surprised when, it, when he, uh, he had seen uh, people cheating on an exam. And he has started explaining that, well, in English, there is not even a, a word for cheating on an exam and people are definitely not cheating. Well, <laughs> I guess that's true that, that, that in, in English speaking countries, students are not cheating on exams. <laughs> <laughs> that's weird. Do you have a you have a special word for cheating on exams? Yes, we, we have we have a special word. So so it's it's just kind of a slang word, I guess. We uh, we use basically the same word which we use for uh, let's say downloading things. So mm -hmm. So download is is also 
uh, to, to cheat on an exam. So we mm. use basically this word. So specifically for exams, not for school tests or for, I don't know. For uh, school tests also. So it's, yeah, it's well, whatever I mean, yes. you... Well, then that's mm. just cheating, isn't it? I mean, yeah. what does it matter if you say that word in, at school or at a university? I mean, impression is basically the same. We have the word for uh, to write down, which would be spisovit, and that's what we use for cheating. Well, like, you know, I, I thought it was just a direct um, word, <laughs> counterpart, counterpart to the English to cheat. So I really don't see your teacher's problem here. It's mm. like, the word exists, it can be used in that context. Uh, and I oh. suppose that he was also not teaching in any uh, English speaking school because I don't really believe that <laughs> in England or, or United States uh, mm. right. students and, and pupils are not cheating on an exam. <laughs> I think that, I mean, you can push that to a different level, though, not just having a word, but I'm just remembering some context. Um, when, when I was um, teaching at a university in Lebanon, um, there was a big problem with students cheating on exams. And I said to the students, if I catch, if you do this, I will fail you. And some student did it and I failed him. And he came to my office and he was very angry and upset, you know. And then the next day he came back and he apologized and he said, I'm sorry, you know, you do it. I said, but why, why did you do this? I told you that if you did this, I would I'd fail you. You didn't need to do this. And he kind of said, well, I mean, it, it was just in talking to him, it just became clear. He, he said, well, you're kind of, it's, I don't know, you're, you're like a fox and I'm like a rabbit and um, it's your job to catch me and my job to try to get away. I mean, he, he just didn't see it as wrong. You know, he, he, he didn't see it as something that he shouldn't be doing. So something, if I can get away with it, then it's okay. Um, so there was a different concept of, of and the way that was cheating, it was like, what they were doing is like, he was, he was helping his friend. So that was more important, helping your friend than uh, keeping the rules. You know, if, if you're cheating by sharing the information, that's a good thing. You're you're helping the other people. So it was just like a totally different concept of of cheating. Um, so you know, if you push it to that level, I think uh, it may have some validity. But yeah, playing an instrument that's um, a bit a bit far. What other kind of interesting uh, ideas came to you guys uh, from? either from my lecture or from the comments or anything else you'd like to, to talk about, spinning off from the questions that came in? Well, um, there was this one commenter, Jackson Powers, who asked about uh, whether language learning actually increases you know, your memory, your baseline memory, or does it simply stop deteriorating memory with age? Well, me personally, I think it's the latter, but I have yet to check that out, seeing as how I'm pretty young still. still. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, well I, I don't have any specific sources, but I think that that's what I heard from like you know, osmosis through lectures, popular you know, popular science lectures, that uh, it really just sort of seems to stop or slow down. Uh, things like dementia, or uh, you know, or just general deterioration from age. So, when what do you guys think? When their language learning actually somehow enhances your innate ability to remember? Like maybe well, you have you some plenty of experience. What what was your, what's your experience with that? My experience is that my memory is basically the same as it ever has been. It's oddly specific for certain things, and um, and other things it just throws out without a second thought and it really does not seem to have changed over the years mm -hmm. so yeah that's why you? i say it doesn't mm -hmm. affect the baseline memory mm -hmm. how about you other two what do you what's your experience katrina yeah Yes, uh, for me also i feel the same thing although i understand that uh, definitely um, learning languages, try to remember the vocabulary, try to remember the, the characters, is definitely improving our memory. I don't feel this improvement. Also, I would like to 
uh, notice here that I, I would like to say that sometimes, not the majority of people, but uh, some of us have autoimmune diseases. For example, me, I have three autoimmune diseases and um, they are not really helping with my memory. So uh, Hashimoto's uh, thyroiditis, uh, for example, like uh, things like that don't help you. Hypothyroidism is not helping actually with uh, memory. But I think if we are consistent and we, we try hard, we also see improvement and uh, we see results, we improve in the language. So even if our memory is not good, of course, I, I remember uh, when I was studying years ago Chinese, it took me like two hours to uh, learn the characters that one of my, my classmates uh, had learned in 30 minutes. And uh, yeah, so it, it was harder for me because I don't think I have a good memory. And through the years, I don't think that my memory has improved. Although, although I understand the logic and definitely it has improved, I don't feel it. Mm. But definitely, I think it would be helpful for uh, all the people as a, as a mental exercise to learn a new language. Even start at an older age, I think it would be very helpful. Yeah. What is your experience? Uh, so I, I think that uh, it depends more on if I'm able to, to convince my brain that, that some, some piece of information is important. <laughs> uh, so, so it's not like that. that uh, my memory uh, has improved in general, but in some areas, yes. So, so uh, if, if uh, I want to uh, learn something by, I don't know, by, by Kafka, uh, I definitely see that, that it's important to, to memorize some uh, new vocabulary, which, which, I, which I meet on, on, my, uh, on my way. Uh, but at the same time, it doesn't mean that uh, I'm able to uh, memorize a, a simple shopping list uh, just because uh, for, for my brain at this point, it's, it's, it's not important. You know, if, if, if I forget to, uh, to buy a butter, it, it, it's not, a, not, a, not, 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 that, not that bad. Uh, so... Yes, in, uh, in this area of, of, of uh, language learning, I think that my memory has improved, but uh, it's not it's not a general improvement in, in other areas. The, the, the scientific studies about language learning and Alzheimer's and that kind of stuff that were making big waves a couple of years back to the, to the best of my memory, haha, pun intended, the best of my memory, but it was about um, the idea is that well, what came out from that was that it learning a second language, learning a second language prevents the onset of Alzheimer's. It doesn't I mean if you're gonna if you get the disease, you'll still get the disease, but you, how swiftly will your brain deteriorate? So it's not going to stop you. It's not like prevent. It's not like an injection that will stop you from catching it. But if you do get it, your brain will stay subtle, you know, flexible for a number of years longer, like five years longer. So it's, it's sort of a, a wards off the symptoms of Alzheimer's. Um, and I think they also found that um, learning one language, maybe it wards off the symptom for five years. And, but then if you learn a second language, it's, it makes it last a little bit longer, but not, not that much longer. So you really have to keep learning more and more and more languages. So um, it's a good excuse to, to, to learn languages, but better to live a healthy life and not catch that condition to um, begin with. I, I find that um, just in my maybe somewhat cynical observations of the world around me, I see that most people that I know um, going about their life don't make any effort to remember anything. Um, they really, particularly in, in current times, I mean, anything that Everybody has a smartphone in their hand. You can always Google something and you just get the answer immediately and you don't need to remember it. And so I think that most of the people that I see um, are trying to remember things. And then when they do try to remember things, it's hard. And then when you 
are learning a language, you are remembering things because you're, if you're building the knowledge there, that's something to remember. Uh, and I do think that um, to me, it is not just, oh, you don't have to wait until you're old and you catch and you, and you get Alzheimer's and you ward off the disease. But if you are actively learning something, it doesn't have to, it can be chemistry. It can be mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, mechanical engineering, which is it? Yeah. Okay. Or uh, museum conservation. If you're, if you're learning something, you know, and building a body of knowledge, I do think that that, you know, is it. I think maybe, Jan, because you're a polymath, you don't notice uh, an increase in memory because you probably have a, a pretty good one already for lots of things. Um, you, you, I'd like to know what you said. Your memory is kind of specific. I mean, I personally, uh, just me, I've always had a really, really good memory for history, names and dates. Just, it's never been the slightest problem for me. Um, I don't have to make any particular effort to re remember and just the, and the logic of it, you know, and then having taught history and at the college level, I just know for so many people, it's, it's, it's no anchors whatsoever. Um, I can't explain that. I, I don't have, you know, the, the, the ease with which I can remember historical names and dates. I don't have that with, with other facts and other things. Um, so it's, uh, as you mentioned, in memory can be oddly specific. I didn't, I didn't program that. I just, I just got that. What is your memory specifically good for? Yeah, for? yeah, it's uh, almost the opposite. I am really terrible with dates, with names. Uh, whenever I read historical texts, I just sort of, I read them, I can enjoy them, I can like them in the moment. Then when people try to ask me what it was about, I usually draw a blank. For instance, I'm reading about Ca uh, the history of the Catalan countries and Catalan right now. And like, yeah, I enjoy the language, I understand most of it, but yeah, the, the, like you said, the logic just does not flow for me. That's one thing. Another thing is uh, events in my life. I can, if not forget, I just sort of forget the, um, the influence. I don't feel like there was anything particular yesterday, even though if I try, I can recall it. But then things like um, hard facts, um, you know, scientific facts, the things that I learn about through books, through uh, lectures, online lectures, stuff uh i usually retain those and i retain things that are that are logical you know either mathematically or um let's say philosophically you know like the sort of this uh, whenever i read the um the new testament i do try to follow the logic of the thing that was said here follows uh follows um leads into something else that was said to a different event and i can follow that um so yeah, I guess mine is almost the mirror image of your selectivity. Mm. Mm. And, um, and there was another thing that I forgot that I wanted to say. So I guess we'll just leave it at that. Speaking of memory you forgot. <laughs> yes, exactly. Katarina, Marcin, did you have another point? Uh, it doesn't have to be necessarily from the comment section, but just something you wanted to ask or talk about? Uh, Yes, um, I wanted to. I want us to talk a little bit more about this philosophical point where um, we said that we are programmed through the language that we speak, and it is very, very important, especially nowadays, uh, to be able to speak other languages so we can um, uh, we can understand like uh, the manipulation of uh, the media, like the control, the thought control, the propaganda. And I think this is a very, very important point. And for the people that are thinking about learning languages, this is um, uh, an important motivation because I'm thinking if I would speak only Greek, for example, what access mm -hmm. would I have to the news? If I had access only uh, to Greek news or uh, news that are translated from English uh, speaking uh, channels or uh, that uh, someone else has selected, what mm -hmm. would I be able to know about the world? But being able to understand English and uh, watch uh, news in English or in French, for example, or in uh, Chinese or in Japanese, it is a, uh, for me, it is easier to to understand what is really happening in the world, to see the different types of propaganda from different countries and uh, find the truth somewhere in between all of these news and uh, create my own idea of what is uh, really happening. Mm -hmm. So I think this is very important. Um, 
it is uh, really preventing us from being brainwashed and controlled. Mm -hmm. Like uh, learning languages is opening up our minds and it helps us to stay free, basically. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. Mm -hmm. yeah, Jan, you wrote something in response to that point too, that you said it, uh, you had most of your negative experiences in, in Russian and you don't. No, it was, was it the opposite. Russian? Yeah. It was that um, it was the opposite that most of my negative experiences in life were through the medium of Russian because I live in Russia and um, you know typically bad things happen with the Russian language being used. Whereas uh, English for a long time has been my uh, safe haven. It's the language that I received so much influence on my life from through, and I just can I would not be the person I am today if it wasn't for. English for uh, making that breakthrough, for accessing all of that info, and uh, yeah, what uh, Katarina said is really, really true. I would, uh, I don't know what what I would be, but I would definitely be different. I would not be the same person. And not to mention all the languages that came after English. So yeah, that's that's mm -hmm. really great. Yeah, I'm glad you appreciate that. I mean, yeah, somebody wrote that you know he didn't think it was a good idea. I said, well, that's that's good to you know to have different point of views. I you know respect that, but um, to me, I, I do think that that is definitely one of the most important um, reasons I've ever had. I mean, just it's 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 so liberating to be able to think in a way that you weren't you weren't programmed to think. You know, and it it doesn't you know it it's even it's okay if other people were programmed to think in the new way that I'm thinking, but they, they didn't choose it. I chose it. I chose to, you know, I can, yeah. I can think in German just as well as I can think because I wanted that. I worked hard at that. I chose that. It wasn't that I was born in Berlin, you know, and you could flip that around. Somebody who was born in Berlin, maybe now he can think, like you said, yeah, English would be his safe haven, his liberating thing. So, um, you know, the, 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 these languages, you know, in, in their home areas, they are the official programming. So they're the official voice of the official media, of the official what you're supposed to believe. And everybody's supposed to be buying this now. And everybody's supposed to be thinking this now and be upset and concerned with these topics. And yeah, if that's all you have, you can't get away from that. But if you have, I love the term you used, a safe haven, um, you know, a, a language that you can um, get away from that in by not thinking along those in the same currents. And yeah, Katarina too, as you pointed out, I mean, you can, you can use these other languages to get at other, other media sources. And, you know, when we're all being told, you know, the same story out there in the world, you know, with, you know looking behind the scenes. Mar Marcin, what is your experience and what are your uh, thoughts on this? Yes, so, so in general, I, I agree. Uh, however, I was trying to think also a little bit about what, uh, what this comment uh, could mean uh, about, about uh, Mm, you know that that's it's not really the case and i think that maybe it's just like this that uh, it's just not automatic so uh, if we are uh, mm, looking for 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 this safe haven and and uh, we are looking for another sources of, of information uh, then uh, languages definitely help and 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 uh, can help us a lot uh, but uh, if someone is, is fixed in, in his ideas and, and uh, uh, just, let's say, enjoys the way he, he, was, he was programmed, uh, then uh, it doesn't change a lot how many languages he speaks. Mm -hmm. So, so it's, it's, for me, so it's true. However, it's just uh, more, more a matter of a mindset. So, so if we are uh, looking for, for uh, responses, if we are trying to verify if if the things we 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 heard are are true, if what are other points of view, uh, then then languages definitely help, mm. and and also uh, not just uh, about about uh, regarding verifying information, but also uh, uh, like, uh, seeing how how other other cultures function, how uh, how they. Uh, react on on uh, different uh, events which occur during during our life. Uh, so uh, when I see, for example, that uh, people in some country, when when they uh, are like, uh, meet some stressful situations, they they uh, find it easier to just 
take it easy and 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 uh, to 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 relax. Don't don't uh, get things too seriously. Uh, it's it's easier for me uh, also to to get into this culture and and, and uh, at least try to to um, get something from 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 this mm -hmm. culture. Then, then I have better access to it, of course, when I know the language and and can. Uh, communicate with with people and, and read texts in in this language Jan, did you have any other uh points that you wanted to talk about either you know um, your yes. own polymath uh, mind? Polymath. Yeah. yes uh because i remember the thing that i forgot uh, <laughs> i remember that literally this second that that, that uh you we passed the uh the turn to katarina it's basically the idea, the thing that I wanted to bring up with respect to memory and what you said about memorization, about how people don't care to memorize things and just look things up on the phone. Um, one of the things that we in science and chemistry and physics and other sciences learn is to be able to discern, to be able to discern what needs to be memorized and what are the things that are much better to just look up whenever you need them. So for instance, you need to memorize patterns, you need to memorize the things that make perfect logical sense, sense, the things that are easy to follow through, the things that will be used the most. So for instance, other than logic, that might be some physical constants in our cases, like you know the uh, force of uh, the free, acceler free acceleration, the speed of light, Planck's constant, the Avogadro number, what have you. Um, whereas the things that you look up are the values for some specific substances, for specific materials and our specific conditions. And uh, I think um, the ability to discern is also very important in language. For instance, when I learn a language, I don't, you know, just like you, Professor, I tend to not go ahead and memorize vocabulary uh, very religiously. I just sort of tend to skim through it and uh, get the general gist. But I do try to memorize some of the salient points of grammar, you know, sort of some basic sentences to sort of so that I could recall them and uh, sort of reaffirm my understanding of the grammar. So uh, yeah, that that was the point I wanted to bring up. So uh, what do you guys think about it? Any thoughts? Uh, yes. yes. So. Uh... Yeah, I have a similar opinion on it, so so I also don't try to really uh, memorize everything. And it's, it's got me also another thought that uh, it was, uh, wait a second, uh, it was written uh, in a book and in a presentation also regarding the manuals themselves that uh, they progress systematically from, from easy to difficult, et cetera. Uh, and uh, at this point, I started thinking that, uh, yes, sure. However, right now uh, it's like this, that uh, most manuals are, are printed directly in the, um, uh, in the tar target language from our point of view. Uh, so, it, it's kind of difficult to, to figure out what is easy and what is difficult for a specific nation who is learning the, the language. Mm -hmm. uh, so then, um, uh, yes. Yeah, so so uh, I'm not sure. If, I'm not sure if it's a good idea at all. That that uh, um, it's it's kind of uh, kind of stopped uh, like the, the publish the, the the publishing houses stopped uh, uh, printing uh, like own own manuals for for uh, for each country yeah it really is an, uh, something to wonder about what is going on in the minds of of manual and textbook publishers i mean in terms of thinking you know is this are they really thinking that this is a good idea? Is this an improvement? Is, you know, when they put out a new edition and they say, well, we used to do this, we're not gonna do this anymore. We have something better to substitute for it. I don't know. Um, it, is, it is enigmatic. Um, Jan, you, you were talking about memorizing stuff. You wrote to me, I think, that you said that you want to um, write 
some textbooks or something in minority languages in Russia, Russia languages that don't have anything there. So would, could you could we flip the topic to that? I mean, what 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 would those be? And what so you want to write a chemistry textbook in Azerbaijani or something like that? Well, no, not specifically the uh, minority languages in Russia. I, I, I can see how you could have thought that. And in fact, I have not yet really gotten into any of the minority languages in Russia specifically. Um, although I do plan to get to them specifically to the uh, polysynthetic languages like Chukchi, like Aleut, um, and maybe some Turkic languages, some Uralic languages, but that's uh, that's a story for another day. Now, I meant things like uh, Skaj Gaelic, Skaj Gaelic, mm -hmm. which does not really have, it, it has official support, it is used as a teaching medium, but I was unable to find any textbooks of my own. And uh, one other ones, uh, let me just think back. It wasn't just minority languages, it was also ancient languages. For instance, there are plenty of books written in Latin, plenty of science books, those are obviously all dated. Some of them mm -hmm. are still relevant, especially in the field of maths. But I really, really would like to see a book in proper classical Latin on quantum mechanics, on contemporary chemistry, and the same with Old Norse, because yes, you could just read it in contemporary Icelandic. And in fact, I have found textbook on quantum mechanics in Icelandic. But, you know, for me personally, for my taste, Icelandic is just not the same as Old Norse. And I would really like to bring it back to Old Norse, to Old English, um, sort of um, because of the thing that I said at the beginning, I really like to combine the fields that I'm studying, the fields that I'm interested in. And that would be a great way to sort of overlap my love for languages and my love for uh, science. So writing um, a textbook yeah. in quantum mechanics in, in Latin. In Latin, in yeah. Norse, in all church Slavonic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, uh, yep. That's my dream. I'm slowly working towards that, uh, but it's it's a far off project. And uh, and of course, minority languages too. I would uh, really be able, love to be able to help them. So because, because one of the problems with minority languages, such as the ones that I'm planning to learn, like Aleut, Chukchi, um, what else, Tibetan. Well, Tibetan isn't really a minority language, but still. The problem is that there's just not enough content. You know, it goes back to the thing that we keep talking about, the fact that we need dialogues. We need dialogues that you know, sort of keep us engaged, dialogues that are relevant and interesting for us. And um, for me, one of the topics that's really interesting is science, the different fields of uh, branches of science. And there just isn't enough material for that. And um, mm -hmm. I'd really love to be able to contribute to the uh, availability of these languages for new learners and for the longevity of languages because, mm -hmm. well, the presence of material is what contributes to longevity. And I'm really worried for the longevity of languages like Chukchi and Aliyut, which I keep coming back to because the only things I have been able to find are either really short folk stories or else uh, translations of the, of the Bible, which, you know, the Bible is great. I'm not saying anything against the fact that this tremendous work of uh, world literature has been has been translated into these languages, but that's just not enough. You know, it's not enough mm -hmm. to keep us engaged, especially seeing as how, uh, well, you know, the language in the Bible is not necessarily conversationally uh, apt, shall we say. So yeah, I really want to be able to contribute to the languages. I, 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 I think that what you just said is, you know, is true. I mean, maybe if, if you can control your desire to write uh, an incredibly advanced, complicated textbook in quantum mechanics and, and write a, a somewhat simpler one that more people would have access to, then I think people could actually yeah. see that. Yeah, I mean, it, it is useful, you know, to have access to Latin. Uh, people want to buy, um, you know, people, people translate usually simple children's books. I don't know if you know guys, well, there's Harry Potter, of course, there's Winnie the Pooh there, you know, there's a long tradition of translating Robinson Crusoe and other things into Latin so that people um, can can read that. So I think that, yes, if you had um, a uh, somehow a, a more, you know, a well-written Latin textbook of, of basic, you know, mathematics, some people definitely could combine that. Here in the United States, there are a lot of people who 
um, in there's a, a movement called homeschooling where people want to take control of their children's own education. And among homeschoolers, I think that that would be very popular. Um, they want to learn Latin. They want to learn math. I think that you could write, you know, if, if that were accessible to, to children and, and if you can somehow do that in the same way that uh, Orberg does, you know, where it's sort of self-intuitive. I mean, you can see how it's, it's building on itself. I think that would be quite, quite interesting. Now that we're talking about older languages again, um, Katerina, um, I'm not going to hold you up, but just because you're a Greek is a complete expert on all things Greek, but that just keeps coming up in some of our recent conversations. What about the pronunciation the of ancient Greek, modern, using modern Greek to sub-vocalize it? How, how different oh, yes. to your ears is, is ecclesiastical Greek and, and, and Attic Greek from, from modern Greek? And what, was it really a tonal language? You've studied Chinese now. Was ancient Greek really a tonal language like Chinese? The way these these people here have have you heard the recordings for this? Have you heard no, these no, I haven't heard yeah. the recording for That's, this, but I have yeah. heard on the internet people yeah. reading texts. Yeah. First of all, I would like to go back to the previous uh, discussion circle where Christopher, I think, had mentioned. Um, the English speaking people, when they read Shakespeare, for example, they don't stop to think, how am I going to read that? They just go and read it the way they pronounce the words today and they can mm -hmm. enjoy the text and understand. So the same thing is happening for us here in uh, Greece. Of course, we don't know the exact pronunciation that the ancients uh, had. Uh, it's not exactly the same as Chinese tonal, but we have uh, the the long vowels and we don't exactly know uh, there are many long e sounds for example and we're not exactly sure how in what way they were different but uh, we read it um, in the new modern greek pronunciation and it sounds very natural especially attic um, of course, if you go to Homeric, uh, uh, there it is difficult, but still the pronunciation, we use the same pronunciation anyway. And uh, for us, it sounds natural because also we have words that, for example, kere, kere, we say the same word, the same exact word uh, as they used in antiquity. Also, there are people that had uh, that were speaking certain dialects, as you know, in southern of Italy. And also, uh, my grandmother was uh, Pontiac Greek. So when she came, she was uh, speaking the Pontiac dialect, and she was saying "ilaxon." "Ilaxon" is the ancient Greek for uh, uh, the word to bark, "gavizo" in modern Greek. But "ilaxon," and she was pronouncing many many sounds the same way but in some sounds some diphthongs for example little little differently in sound but you can understand it so for us i mean especially the erasmian pronunciation sounds so 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 strange it's like mm -hmm. the I cannot explain it, but of course Erasmus was a great scholar and I don't think that even Erasmus made a, a proposal of how it could be. As today people make uh, guesses, scholars study and try to make guesses about the sounds of uh, uh, Middle Chinese or Classical Chinese, or, but we can never know. We don't have a, the recording, actually. No so, recordings, yeah. yeah, so whatever we say, it's like, OK, because Erasmus was uh, uh, the great scholar that he was, we have to accept uh, what he said as if it is correct. I mean, for us, it sounds so strange. Mm. Um, also, I so, want to say when, uh, oh, excuse me, one last, yes. Uh, uh, yeah. For for biblical uh, Greek, for for example, I have uh, heard especially um, not a, this is not about ancient Greek now. Um, I have heard people um, reading in what uh, we call in Greece kini, and uh, in in English speaking countries they say koine, koine something, mm -hmm. but it is kini. The diphthong omicron yota is like a long e sound. 
skinny. And I have noticed that, for example, they say koine, but when, when they read in, in the Bible, or if you hear the Bible, you see that it says, for example, ikea, ikos, the house, ikos, omicron, yota, e, ikos. So the sound in the word kini is the same as the sound in the word ikos, this e. So this is a terrible misunderstanding, I think. And mm -hmm. I don't know what is the way to, to change that because it has prevailed. And now, like, especially ancient Greek sounds so, so, like, no, not Greek. But if I read, if I take mm -hmm. a book, you know, I have one book, like, um, these are Themata Archeon Elinon. Uh, these are Xenophon, Plato, um, uh, Plutarch, Aristotle, Demosthenes, uh, and all of these. If if I read it, and if someone would read it in modern Greek and ancient Greek, yeah, okay. If you if you have a, a, a almost basic knowledge from school from for about the ancient Greek. It is very easy for you to read and understand Xenophon or Plutarch, so, so, so easy. But if you try to read poetry, if you try to read the Homeric Greek, or there you have to study because you don't understand anything. Okay, it sounds Greek to you, but you don't understand the meaning. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think uh, in, in the, one of the comments there, somebody pointed to um, some a whole series of videos that have been produced by some teacher in, uh, in Italy from some Italian island. And I guess I didn't follow that up thoroughly, but I guess what they were implying is that um, I think some historical linguists do think that there are somehow isolated pockets of places where sometimes the language can be preserved in an older form. So um, in the language, when it's part of the sort of the current of, of, of um, intellectual development, it changes more and it changes faster. But if you lock it off and isolate it, maybe somehow that will stay there. So I guess that person was intimating that if you go to some of the isolated islands, uh, maybe you'll find a, a form of, of more ancient Greek. I think that that might be true to a certain degree, but all language is always changing and evolving, even if it isn't cut off. So I, I don't know what's that. Do either of you guys have a strong thoughts or feelings about this? Yeah, it looks like you were looking up some uh, resources or something to check on something. Yeah. Like um, well, well, maybe Martin has something to say. I, you know, he hasn't yeah. said much. Uh, but... Martin, nothing, yeah. about, nothing about Greek, however, uh, that, that reminded me uh, about uh, uh, a similar Latin book. Uh, and I know there is a, a huge discussion about about uh, quality of, of recordings. Uh, and I have used actually the, 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 the new recordings for, for us in Latin and uh, they were uh, quite okay. So, so uh, mm -hmm. they didn't sound uh, Italian to me. There are mm -hmm. actually uh, two versions with, with, uh, with the book. One is ecclesiastical and this sounds Italian, of course. But there is also uh, a CD with this uh, restored pronunciation. Uh, and uh, this one sounds good, and, and uh, I haven't had any interference with, with my Italian when I was, when I was uh, mm -hmm. using and shadowing the, the Latin books. So uh, no, it's, the, it's the original recordings that were made back in the, I don't know, the late, nine, I think 1963, that are just totally, it's, it's neither of those pronunciations, it's pure, it's pure French. You know, and I guess you could say, well, French is a dialect of Latin, so I'm going to speak Latin this way. You know, I guess that was somewhat, somewhat of their logic, but it, it doesn't fit anybody's conception. So they're they're pretty strange to listen to. So um, exactly, the, the new ones are are fine. So so mm -hmm. uh, it, it was pleasant to shadow them. Mm -hmm. I, I do think though that it's it is very important to. I, I mean, yes. I, the, the, correct pronunciation of a to sub vocalize to have something it is important to have that but I think it people can get so hung up on it um, that you know they're concerned well if, if I don't if I have the wrong pronunciation I'll be doing damage so I don't know if it's right so I'm sort of going to hold off and not do it and even that I mean yes listening to shadowing to something but I think it's important ultimately particularly with ancient languages something like Latin 
I mean, yes, having some, some, a better recording of Asimil's course is better than having a bad recording of Asimil's course, but you don't want to stay listening to the recording. It's more important to get the sound in your head and then pick up the book like Katrina's and read the book aloud. Reading aloud is hit, hit, when you're using your own voice, that's when you really sort of bring a language to life and, and, and hear it and know it. So getting, getting enough of the sound, and that's, that's what Hall was talking about. And I think it came up in one of the other things, learning to, you have, need to learn how to speak before you can read. Well, it doesn't mean you need to have a full conversation. It means you need to be able to make the sounds. You need to be able to know how it sounds. Once you can do that, then you can, particularly with a Latin book that, you know, Jan could write a mathematical book in Latin, and then I could pick it up and I could read that. And that would be how I would really be sort of activating all the Latin and the mathematical circuits in my brain. Um, so I think that that's an important thing to remember that yeah, getting, getting, getting a good model, be it, you know, of Greek or Latin or something in, and then using it to, to read aloud is what we really um, are aspiring to. I think so. Jan, did you have something to, to add to that? Well, yeah, since we're talking about ancient languages and pronunciation, um, for one, yes, it is important to not get too hung up on some things because, well, you know, speaking of Latin, I am strongly in favor of the recreated pronunciation. I learned my Latin from uh, Lucio Stranieri, who is, is, is an excellent speaker, and uh, I really appreciate the work that he's done. And, um, you know, uh, whenever I listen, whenever I hear people speak ecclesiastically, you know, people, have, even people that are as fluent as Luke, um, well, it's really great. And it's like, it's like a bad accent or, or, or an accent from a place that, that, that it sounds wrong to you. But I don't make that about other people. That's my problem. And I just choose to not listen to that. And I, I'm not telling people to do otherwise. But one point I do, what I would like to make is that um, no two languages ever have the same phonology, right? No, that's true of contemporary languages, mm -hmm. and it's true of languages diachronically. The, the phonology of contemporary Greek is whatever it is, whatever it was, it was distinctly different back in the day. And I want to demonstrate that with, uh, with uh, Old Church Slavonic, which is actually one of the first languages that I learned after English. You know, by accident. Um, you know, normally people use the, well, in Russia, people use the Russian pronunciation. In Serbia, they use the Serbian pronunciation, so on and so, on, so, on, so forth. Uh, but, you know, these are really different languages. And uh, if, if you don't mind, I would just like to read a random place from, uh, from the uh, New Testament. Please let us hear some old church yeah. Slavonic. Yeah, so like first I'll read a short sentence in the Russian pronunciation, and hopefully, Alexander, you might try to um, sort of uh, take a take a stab at trying to understand it. Mm -hmm. Your Russian, uh, Martin, can also try to do that. It is Polish. So here we go. И слышаста его обучи никал глаголюще и по Иисусе доса. Обращайся же Иисус и видев я по себе идуща глаголима часо ищета. All right, that, so that was the Russian. And I'm mm -hmm. sure, like, hopefully you got tripped up on the ya yeah in the middle of the sentence because that shouldn't make any sense from the point of view of contemporary Russian or Polish because that means I in, um, in Russian and Polish. But now I'll try to use a reconstructed pronunciation. So here we go. Ye slyšaste jego oba učenika klagolyusha i po Jesuse i dosta obrašče se Jesus, you will be yen for the bear, it dushan, clacola yima, chesso ischeta. So here, because I use the reconstructed pronunciation, I change the ya into yen, yen with the with a nasal vowel. And that doesn't mean I, it means they, it means they in all church Slavonic. And that really drives home why these languages are different. Because if we try to apply contemporary pronunciation to ancient languages, we might get confusing moments like this. And then we wonder why people don't understand these ancient texts. Well, probably because of interference from, uh, from their own language and from this insistence on trying to use contemporary pronunciation when it's really not that apt in my personal opinion. But again, I'm not trying to force that on anyone, just sort of trying to illustrate that. I think you have a very good point there. 
um, but just to nuance it, neither Russian, uh, Russian is not a direct descendant of old Church Slavonic the way Actual. the modern is. Actual. It is, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's maybe it's a different a, branch. It's Great grandmother, or something great, a great aunt, or something is it, it, there's you know, the historical outgrowth yes. of it. There's a relationship there. Um, but if you look at, you know, if you look at Greek, I mean, it's still in Greece. If you look at Latin, um, it's you could say again, I think people could make more of a point for the fact that really the modern Romance languages are Latin dialects that have gotten out of control. Um, so uh, but no, no one of them is, you know, can say, has a better claim to saying I am the direct descendant of Latin, so you should speak Latin with an Italian accent or a Catalan accent or something like that. So um, I think Greek and Greek and Norse are kind of case apart, you know, that, you know, they're, you can say this is the direct, this is the, that's the great grandmother, not the great grand, aunt, not the great somebody here, you know, not, not some historical relation to this, a direct historical correlation. But um, Bro, bro. Yeah, thank you for sharing that old church Slavonic. That's not something you get to hear every day. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what, what was he saying? Hey, what are you looking for? It was what are you looking for? The disciples said to him, and he said, Why where do you come? What are you seeking? Yeah, that's that's what he said. Just yep. so you should know. And that also now is the we are ending, the ta, uh -huh. that's the dual, which is uh -huh. absent from contemporary Russian and Polish. Mm -hmm. So yeah. It was something from John's. I didn't. I didn't catch what what when exactly it was. It was something from John. Mm -hmm. Good. Do, do you have also any any recordings of, of texts with uh, with restored uh, or old church Slavonic? You know, I had a recording of uh, some old church Slavonic being read aloud but i have not really listened to it in ages i don't remember uh, it was uh, it was one of the really old uh, recon uh, it was one of the really old monuments and i really don't remember if they used the restore pronunciation and in general old church slavonic really does not get the uh, the attention and the support that latin greek as in ancient Greek and Old Norse have. Well, I'm sorry, is this, this, do you know this, is this is an old Russian, is it not? This ah, is not. Slova Palku Yigrivia. Slova Palku Yigrivia. Well, I, I can't tell if it's old Russian by the cover because <laughs> that's what we call it in contemporary Russian. It is a very dated form, Yigrivia. Uh, nobody says it that way. So, like, yeah, let me, let me have a look here. Igor Gdono, one we did. Uje Bobed, Igor Pasit, please. Yeah, okay. So, it's. This is uh, medieval English. Russian, right? This is, so this is more of a direct thing. So, yeah, I'm sorry, I was, I was listening to you as I was looking for that too. I was thinking, uh, you were saying Old Church Slavonic doesn't get the sort of the, the respect that sort of Old Norse and, and Latin get. Um, not justifying that, but I'm just curious. I mean, isn't it sort of like Gothic in the sense that I mean, what is there? What is there to read in Old Church Slavonic? Is, you know, absolutely, there... absolutely true, and that's really, really sad for me that there is very there is practically nothing aside from translations of the Bible mm -hmm. in Old Church Slavonic. Um, that's why I want to sort of create continent because I just love the grammar of this language. It's just when I learned it, it opened up so much. It explains so much nonsense about the Russian language. And it just it really left an impression on me. And it's just in itself, it's so logical. It's so much more consistent. Some varieties, of course, because, you know, obviously it was not a standardized language back in that day. But now that we have grammars, we, we have more, more complete picture and I really like that but there is there is some more literature in um, medieval Russian or medieval Belarusian medieval Ukrainian whatever you call it and because it was used as an official language in for instance the um, the Grand Duchy of Lithuania even though it was Russian it was used in Lithuania and I have read a grammar that was written entirely in this old Russian Belarusian and it was really great that I was able to find any of the um, documents that were written in it, supposedly. But uh, hmm. yeah, it's close, but it's not. It's not, it's not the same. Marcin, how do but you, yeah, as a Polish speaker, how do you, how did you feel to the the old, uh, the different pronunciation from 
when, when uh, I haven't I haven't understood almost anything from uh, from it. That doesn't <laughs> matter which which pronunciation. <laughs> so have, that, have, I guess have, that is because you, it's because it's just too far away. <laughs> have either, there are some efforts at sort of talking about? Uh, I guess we've had the conversation now in, in some of the recent discussions here about sort of going the other way, learn, using the modern language for this. But there are also some efforts. I don't want to say at um, reconstructing um, pan Slavonic, but there are some people out there saying, "Well, let's let's take let's somehow not do what Zamenhof did with Esperanto and try to make a world language of everything, but let's take at least all the Slavic languages and somehow." Make a, a pan Slavic language uh, that would be accessible to, to everybody. Have have either of you had any experience with that? Well, Martin, do you have anything to say? As a, as a constructed language, like like yeah. Esperanto, but just well, I, I'm not really fond of of uh, constructed languages. Uh, well, for for me, the main reason is that when I learn a language, I I want to. Uh, read culture, something right? which yeah. was the culture and, and I want to uh, enjoy some some books written in in, uh, in this language so not mm. translated into that language because if I want this then mm. then learning languages makes no sense because I, I can just read translations into Polish yeah? mm. uh, <laughs> but uh, so, so in Esperanto now probably there, there are some some people who consider themselves uh, natives and 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 uh, write something which which was uh, written from from the starting in, in esperanto mm -hmm. but for for from my point of view constructed languages is, is just not my thing oh, so, so forget the constructed language. as a poll how how well can you understand other slavic languages you understand uh, czech pretty well right uh, Czech, yes, and, and uh, I have uh, made this experience with uh, Croatian. Uh, so uh, we had just a, just a small uh, integration trip uh, organized by our company. So I decided that okay, so we have still like half a year. Let's let's see uh, how much Croatian can I learn. And it was fun mm. because. Uh, mm, I bought a, a Asimil book for, for, for Germans because in, in Polish it was not available. And after a couple of units, I stopped using German translation at all because it was so clear based on, based on uh, my native language that uh, uh, yes, when, when, I, when I just passed the, 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 that threshold, uh, uh, which stopped me from, from uh, understanding the basics. Then mm -hmm. it was it was fairly easy. So so uh, in this short period of time, uh, I was not able to to speak Croatian well. Uh, however, uh, I, I was able uh, to uh, translate pretty well to my colleagues uh, private conversations of our tour guide. <laughs> so. Uh, <laughs> Jan, you've got your your eyes set on Alut and Old Norse and all this. Do you have any any scope for other Slavic languages other than other than Old well, Slavic? In fact, what uh, my sort of specialty, if you could say that, in learning languages have been the Slavic languages and Germanic languages. So mm -hmm. continuing Russian and English, which were my two most developed languages. Yes, I in fact I know Polish pretty well. It's not any amazing level, but it's, I'm conversationally fluent. I can understand most stuff unless it's highly specialized. Uh, I'm also very well versed in Belarusian. I can understand Ukrainian pretty effortlessly. I have studied Slovakian, the Slovak, Slovak, but uh, you know, sort of given up on it. But at this point, at this point, whenever I pick up, oh, and I've also had very short excursion into Croatian. Uh, because I wanted to access a particular book in correlation. So yeah, it was mm -hmm. much like with uh, Marcin, uh, where I first I followed the textbook, but then I just sort of, yes, I, okay, I got the declensions. I see how you changed it from Old Church Slavonic, because Old Church Slavonic is a wonderful, wonderful uh, sort of reference point for learning any Slavic language, because it there was a really clear progression from Old Church Slavonic to the contemporary Slavic languages. Well, I mean, by analogy, by analogy. Um, so it really helped. 
uh, and now I sort of still I plan to go through all of the Slavic languages that there are resources out there for. But lately, whenever I pick up a new East Slavic language, such as Ruthenian uh, or uh, Rusin, I meant to say, or uh, recently I started on Polesian, which is called Palieski. Maybe Marcin has heard something about that region. Basically, I pick them up and they're so similar to Russian, Polish, Belarusian, and Ukrainian that I just really don't need to go through any grammar. I just pick it up and it's immediately clear, basically 99.99% of what's on the page. So uh, yeah, that's both, uh, that's both, um, yeah, shall we say, it feels great being able to start pick up a language without learning it, but at the same time, it sort of makes you lose interest. Not enough challenge, to, not enough of a challenge. Not enough of a challenge to sort of keep going yeah. with it for too long. Katerina, on the one hand, the fact that Greek only has uh, one modern descendant means that you're more justified in using your pronunciation to read old texts, but on the other hand, there's no sister languages, no, no other languages that Greek gives you immediate access to, or are there? Have you found that your Greek has actually helped you with other things? I, I mean, we, uh, we're looking at the other way, saying so much of our vocabulary in English comes yeah, from Greek, yeah. that learning Greek helps you with English. Does, does, does your Greek yeah, help le you? Learning, knowing, knowing Greek has helped with English, especially vocabulary. When I read the English literature, when uh, there are Greek words or words that have Greek roots, it is so easy for me to understand. I don't need to study this difficult vocabulary for uh, the rest of the English learning uh, um, people. But uh, also I had noticed, but this I'm not sure, maybe, maybe uh, I found it easier to understand uh, Italian, although it is irrelevant, but I don't know. Also, when we were studying Latin at school, maybe some words, maybe because they they came from ancient Greek or something, it was easier for me to understand some simple sentences or some words vocabulary, even though I uh, we weren't taught uh, this vocabulary yet. But mm -hmm. I haven't noticed that to any other uh, with any other language. No. Mm -hmm. no. Yeah. Yeah, that's I that's think... interesting because for for me at least uh, when I have started learning Italian and and haven't had any experience uh, earlier with uh, Romance languages, uh, Italian was uh, a bit difficult. I must admit. So so later, of course, when when I when I passed through the basics, it was okay, but uh, but it was difficult. So it's interesting to to hear that uh, uh, for you it was. Uh, uh, well, I don't want to say fairly easy language, but uh, you haven't had at least any problems. <laughs> I think we're going uh, on quite long now, so um, yeah, maybe I, we're yeah. having a very interesting conversation, but I hope other people will want to watch this. Um, I hope that I'm, I, I'm planning on continuing this format, so maybe we all will have a chance to meet and talk again in, in some point in the future. But before we say goodbye, I just wonder if there's any burning question that any of you wanted to ask me or, or talk about among ourselves before we say thank you. Anything that we just, didn't get to? I have just, just one question uh, mm -hmm. regarding uh, uh, typical uh, books with, with uh, grammar exercises, uh, because uh, uh, everything which we have discussed uh, here and what, what was written in, in, in the book was uh, like in, in the context of the manual. So, so we have some material, we have then some drills, uh, mm -hmm. but uh, nowadays there, there are available a lot of, of books. Uh, so we have like uh, three, 400 pages book uh, filled with, with exercises. Uh, do you think that, that uh, those kind of books are useful and do you have any opinion how, how to use them because I can't really imagine going through 400 pages of, of grammar exercises like from cover to cover. Um, well, I mean, there are minds that um, like that kind of thing that find that useful. So I don't think that they should be used for people who don't have those kind of minds. And I think that those kind of things um, 
maybe Katarina can speak up as a, as a high school, would you say you're, you're an English teacher? I mean, it seems to me things like that are pretty much, the main use is preparing for tests, for standardized tests. I think that grammar, you, we, there are a lot of places in the world where you know having a standardized test in a language is, is a very important part of getting your, your school degree, and that's the way they teach those. So I think that if you're trying to pass a test and or you have the kind of mind that really enjoys that, um, then it can be helpful. Um, it might also be helpful uh, at a certain stage when you say, you know, I, I, I know that I'm very advanced in this language now, but I know I'm not perfect and I'm never going to be perfect, perfect, but I would like to really polish things off. So give me some, you know, some that then, you know, you might be interested in it, but as a basic, basic learning uh, procedure, I would, I don't think so. Yeah, I know. I saw you almost getting a headache when he was mentioning that. You don't like the idea of it either? Well, it just really sounds absolutely soul-crushing seeing that, especially <laughs> for people that like to sort of complete things to say that, mm -hmm. okay, I've read this, I've done this. Um, but, you know, it's, it's something that people like me have to work on and sort of let go of this desire to mm -hmm. really complete a book and stuff. And then and that just reminds me of the uh, of the exercise book for Old English from uh, Henry Sweet's uh, to mm -hmm. as a supplement to Henry Sweet's book on Old English, where mm -hmm. he's got like 48 exercises that are like translating about 15 sentences and I'm going through them and because I'm enjoying it. But uh, yeah, I'm thinking that I'm not going to finish it all up. Maybe I will layer to polish, as you said, because yeah, I totally agree with what you said about that. Hmm. And uh, well, since we're having closing thoughts or just final comments, I just really wanted to get this out there. Uh, I was reading the book uh, by Hall, mm -hmm. and on page 60, on page 60, he said one thing that just made me chuckle so hard. He said, There is no such thing as general grammar. And that <laughs> cracked me up because of, because of Chomsky. Yeah. And his universal he, grammar. He, so he and Chomsky yeah. were were deadly enemies. They they um, oh, they were oh. after they lived together. They lived at the same time. Yeah, oh. yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. No, okay. they were they were intellectual enemies, definitely. Okay, I see. I see. That that makes sense. So so we can consider it some kind of a greeting to to to, to Chomsky. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is this is anti Chomskyism. Katerina, did you have a closing thought? I I would like to say that um, uh, we said that uh, sometimes when uh, we consider language learning as uh, we regard it as a some corrective to the accident of birth, mm -hmm. and uh, I think that many times in my life I have felt um, really happy, and I think it was my privilege to be born in this country that although uh, the economy is terrible and uh, many things uh, are really terrible and not working, I, I feel really blessed that I am able to speak and understand Greek so deeply because if because I have access to all this literature, I have this connection with uh, the ancients it's so easy to, to, to read the texts and with uh, very basic uh, studies, I, I can understand what Aristotle wrote. Um, I feel so privileged. So I, I'm happy that uh, there was no, I don't consider for myself there was any accident uh, um, <laughs> of birth. And uh, I think that uh, other people have the same feeling, like people that speak Russian and they can read Dostoevsky from the original, or people that were born in Japan and they can read uh, Mishima Yukio from the original. Uh, this we should consider that a privilege and uh, well, privileges of birth come uh, as well definitely thank you for bringing appreciate that, that the yeah. language that we speak we should appreciate the language that we speak everyone mm. was absolutely well, case by case uh, this case by case thing to be honest like uh, i really resonated with the thing that uh, the professor said mm. it's point number one so but it's different for you and that's also valid mm. Okay, well, 
I think uh, we uh, should wrap it up then so we can give somebody something, you know, expect people to watch the whole talk. So um, it's your evening now. It looks like I can see the Moscow night skyline there behind you. Um, it's getting on my lunchtime here. So um, we're different worlds apart, but we were able to participate and get to know each other this way. Thank you so much for um, spending this time uh, with me and for having an interesting conversation that hopefully others will find just as, just as stimulating. And um, we'll continue this conversation in comment sections. And like I said, perhaps we can uh, meet again like this, or if I open a virtual academy, you can come and, and be in part of that. I would okay. be just uh, All right. Goodbye. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Goodbye. Mm -hmm. Goodbye.